Hi. Nice to see everybody again. Okay, so last time when we finished, we were stuck trying to prove the product rule. Right. So today we want to get ourselves unstuck. Let me just quickly recall what we did prove last time. First, we prove that if, so here, f and g are differentiable functions, and c is a constant, then <coughs> well, first we prove that the derivative of the sum, and well, we didn't prove it, but it's going to follow actually from the following property. All right, so we can also take the derivative of the difference. It's just the sum or difference of the derivatives. And then we also proved that if you multiply a function by a constant and take the derivative, that this is the same as first taking the derivative of the function and multiplying by the constant. Okay. And where we got stuck was looking at the following, which is if you take the product of two functions and look at their derivative. We wanted to say that this was the well, product of the derivatives, right? but it's not true. We believe we verified that with a simple example. Okay? So we're stuck trying to figure out what this is. Okay? And so what we did is, well, we started writing down the definition of the derivative of the product. Right? So this says you look at this difference quotient as h goes to 0. Right? Okay, so we looked at this and we said, we can't do anything with this sign. Right? Remember, we were just stuck. We're like, what, what in the world can you do? Okay, so then we said, well, why don't we, right, we, we knew what we wanted to prove, namely that this was equal to the function f times the derivative of g prime plus f prime times, or that is the derivative of f times g. So we wrote down what this would mean. And we tried to fiddle around with that, and we got stuck. <coughs> So we just didn't know what to do. So we said we need to have some clever idea. Okay. So I'll show you what the, well, maybe you won't agree it's clever, but I'll show you what the idea is. Okay. We go back to this, and we're just going to add zero. Okay. This seems to be a prevailing theme, right, in some of our trickier problems, right? You just add nothing. Of course, that doesn't change anything, but sometimes it gives you a little more flexibility. So let's see what we're going to add. So we're going to leave a little space okay so smack dab in the middle of this thing I'm going to add f of x plus h times g of x and it looks like I didn't add enough room okay. you can add more room either plus f of x plus h g of x and I can't forget my minus f of x. And of course, this is all sitting over h. So the only difference in these two equations is this bit here, which is, of course, equal to 0. So this seems pretty pointless, yeah? Why add 0 to something? But if I do this, I get to play now the following game. These first two terms both have an f of x plus h. So I can factor it out. So I get g of x plus h minus g of x. Ah, this is already very, very good. Think of the derivative of g. 
on top it's going to have a g of x plus h minus a g of x. Ah, so this is, this is a good start. So that took care of the first two terms. Now the second two terms both have a g of x inside. Okay, so I can factor that out. And what am I left with? Well, f of x plus h minus f of x. Oh, this is really starting to look good. Of course, everything is still over h. But, ooh, you know what? I somehow, I know that I'm going to need to split this up. I mean, look at the end what I want to get. f times the derivative of g. Okay? That's somehow going to come from this term and this term. And this is going to be plus the derivative of f times g. That, that's going to come right from these terms. So, I really want to split this up as two different fractions. And of course I can, right? I just have right, two things added together over h. I can split it up with two fractions over h. Okay. And let me add some big brackets here to know the limit applies to everything. Okay. okay, now this is this is not so bad. Okay. Because what do I have in here? Right, well, I have a function which by itself, if I forgot about this f of x plus h, the limit as h goes to 0 of this is just the derivative of g. Right, just forget about the f of x plus h. This is, by definition, the derivative of g of x. Right, and by assumption, g is differentiable. So I know that the limit exists. On the other hand, Okay, look at f of x plus h. Now, I want to say that, that this limit exists, that f of x plus h as h goes to 0 exists. How do I know that it exists? Okay, so let's see. What did it mean that the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h exists? <coughs> it almost means that it's continuous. Okay. If it was continuous, I'd know even a little bit more. I would know that not only did f of x plus h, it, the limit exist as h goes to 0, but I would even know that it equals f of x. Okay? But if I have continuous, then I'm golden. All right? Then I certainly get that that limit exists. But f was differentiable. And what did we say? If you're differentiable, then you're continuous. Exactly. Okay? So we know that the limit as h goes to 0 of this term exists. Look over here. If I forget about this g of x, I have the derivative of f, right, as h goes to 0. We know it's differentiable, so that limit exists. <coughs> and g being differentiable is also continuous, which means, well, actually, as far as h is concerned, g of x is a constant, so we don't even need that argument. This limit, as h goes to 0, is going to exist. So all the individual limits exist, which means I can use those limit rules that say I can break up sums and break up products. So I do this very carefully. I get the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h times the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h plus the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h times the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x. Remember, to split it up using those limit properties, I really had to check that each one of these limits exists. That's why I needed to use all this stuff. f is differentiable, g is differentiable, blah, 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 blah. OK, but now we're in perfect shape. OK, as Leith pointed out, right, f is continuous, and so this limit not only exists, but it equals what as h goes to 0? F of x. F of x, exactly. So this is f. I'll just forget the, the of x here for now. Okay, and then this is just the definition of the derivative of g. So f times g prime plus, well, this is the definition <coughs> of the derivative of f. And of course, well, if h goes to 0, who cares? g of x doesn't see h. This is just g of x. Right? Or times g. Okay. Okay. 
So it, so it all works out, right? just by adding zero. Okay, it's kind of weird. Okay, by the way, if you, if you aren't familiar with mathematicians, we usually like to have some symbol at the end of our proofs. Maybe you've heard QED before. Uh, I use a, a box. Let me know. It's the end of the proof. Some use a box with no squiggle on the inside. Some use other symbols. Okay. Cool. So we got a bunch of formulas. Now last week I promised we would also get the power rule. The power rule says the following. Okay, before I write this down, I want to introduce some notation, which I haven't used yet. Notation. So let f of x function x. Uh, actually, let me say differentiable. Differentiable function. Then we often denote, so remember f prime of x means the derivative of f with respect to this variable x. And we're going to denote it another way. We're going to write d over dx of f of x. Or sometimes <coughs> df dx. Or sometimes if we write y equals f of x, then we write dy dx. But the important part is you have this d over dx, and it's not a fraction. Okay? If it was a fraction, I would just cancel the d's and get 1 over x, and we wouldn't be talking calculus anymore. Okay? This is a symbol in its own right. Okay? You don't treat it as a fraction, at least not yet. Later on, we'll see that sometimes you can treat it like a fraction, but not now. I introduce this notation because sometimes I want to write down the derivative of a function without giving the function a name, right? Without having to write let f of x equal dot 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 and then writing down my, my derivative. Okay. Okay, so and, I, and, and it's important that you know this notation because it's used you know, ubiquitously in calculus. Okay. I could write it using all this notation too, but I want you guys to see. Oops, actually I'll tell you what the function is. Okay. So here n is, uh, let's say, a natural number or possibly zero. So that whole zero there means we allow it zero as a natural number. So the claim is that the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. <coughs> it's going to turn out that this restriction on the natural numbers is superfluous. Well, not superfluous, it's just not needed. You can actually make this any real number. But this is harder to prove. Alright, so let's see how we would attack this. Okay, so. I want to look at the limit as h goes to 0. Well, I want to take the derivative of x to the n. So the function is x to the n. So everywhere I see an x in the first term, I put x plus h. So I get x plus h to the n minus x to the n over h. OK, now, we've already done this proof before. We just didn't use n. We used 2, maybe 3. Okay. And what did we do each time? Well, we expanded this. The first term is x to the n, and it cancels off as minus x to the n. 
Then you get a whole bunch of terms that have H's in them. You factor out one of the H's, cancel things, right? Then you're left with one term which doesn't have an H, and all the other terms have an H. So as H goes to zero, they go away, and then the first term is what you want. Okay. So let's, let's just see if that works. All right, well, the only thing we need is some way of expanding this x plus h to the n term. Okay? And that's, of course, the binomial theorem, which I wrote on the board last time. And uh, I appreciate that you all went home and looked it up and remembered how it worked. You probably even tried to reprove it for yourself using induction. It's brilliant that you could try to do that. Okay, so let's just quickly write it out. So when you expand this, as I said, the first term is going to be an x to the n. The next term is going to be an n times x to the n minus 1 h. Ah, now we should stop. There's more, of course. But <coughs> n times x to the n minus 1. Okay? Somehow this is what we're looking for, right? So we need to isolate that. And of course, now, if we can just get rid of 1h, we're in good shape, right? That h will go away and we'll have exactly that left. We just hope there's no more terms that, that mess us up. But that's okay because the way this thing expands, the next term, you might remember, is something called n choose 2. Okay. If you don't remember what this choose symbol means, if you have n choose c, this is defined to be n factorial divided by n minus c factorial times c factorial. If you don't remember what factorial means, well, 0 factorial is 1, 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2 times 1, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and I think you get the general pattern for this. Okay. And combinatorially what this means is, if I have n objects and I want to choose c of them, how many different ways can I do? So if there's 15 students in the class and I have to choose five of them randomly to get Fs, how many different ways can I do this? So it would be 15 choose five. Right? So you could actually compute it out. And at really boring math conferences, sometimes I do compute just random N choose C. Don't tell the organizers. Okay. So turns out this actually coefficient is N choose zero. N is N choose one, which is easy to verify. Then you get n choose 2, x to the n minus 2, h squared. Okay, notice that if you add up the exponents, that's an n. The exponents always add to n. There's an n, n minus 1 plus 1 is n, n minus 2 plus 2 is n. And the next one would be n choose 3, x to the n minus 3 times h cubed and so forth. Okay, so the h just keeps going up. And eventually at the end, you get a term that looks like h to the n. You just keep getting higher and higher powers of h. And then we have this minus x to the n that we have to remember. Okay. <coughs> See, the binomial theorem actually is useful somewhere. By the way, if you don't want to compute this, you can also write out Pascal's triangle. These give you the, you know, Pascal's triangle, if you recall, it's like 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, and I'm getting the next row by adding consecutive digits from the row above it. Yeah? Okay, and so, for instance, this is n choose, uh, this is a 4 choose 0, 4 choose 1, 4 choose 2, 4 choose 3, 4 choose 4, because it's the fourth row. Third row, second row, first row, zero. Incidentally, if you add up all the numbers in any given row, you know what you get? No? Do it. Okay, add up all these. And one. Add these, you get two. Add these, you get you get four. Add these, you get eight. Sixteen. Notice the pattern. Yeah, we're getting the powers of two out. So, if I wrote down this formula like this and said, okay, now add up all the power, I mean, all these coefficients, the c goes from 0 to n, and told you all these factorials divided by other factorials, when you add them up, you get a power of 2. You know, you'd slap me. 
Go away, Mac boy. I like that punt already got his slapping hand out. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so just nice, fun, interesting tidbits there. In any case, right, I already told you the game we're going to play. Okay? Each one of the terms, all right, well, first the x to the n, the minus x to the n. They go away. All the remaining terms have powers of h in them, at least one. So we factor that out and cancel with the bottom h. So we're left with the limit as h goes to 0 of, okay, the x to the n went away. This h got factored out and canceled. So the first term is nx to the n minus 1. Let me move it down a little bit since it's no longer a fraction. Okay. The next term okay, is the same term, only we got rid of one of the h's when we canceled. So I get n choose to x to the n minus 2 times h. And all the other terms in the middle have more and more h's. And the last term is h to the n minus 1. OK, as h goes to 0, what happens to this thing? Well, every time you see an h that's going to 0, these terms are all going to 0. Right? And all these terms that I'm not writing that do not have h's in them. So all these terms go away, and you're just left with x and x to the n minus 1. Okay. So this is what is affectionately known as the power rule. And let's see, this one is known as the product rule. Well, this top one is usually known as the sum rule. Okay, but I like to think of both these two rules together as linearity. Okay, and unless you take linear algebra, you won't even care about this. But if you do take linear algebra, you'll thank me for calling it that. And you should all take linear algebra. I mean, frankly, you should all become math majors. You told me not to. I did so not tell you not to. Well, I mean, okay, I didn't tell, I mean, I told you not to, but oh, okay. not, not, you know. Because I'm slow, right? Well, okay. I'm not supposed to say these things out <laughs> loud, Kevin. <laughs> but you're doing a great job, and you're special. <laughs> okay. So. What do we do next? Okay, so if you recall, this first big lecture I gave, okay, I listed some more rules, like the quotient rule, okay, and chain rule. Okay, the quotient rule I will prove for you right now, because it's basically the same trick as we did for the product rule. <coughs> the chain rule I won't, because Kevin told me not to last week. He said that enough with these proofs, let's just learn how to use this stuff. Give me the formula and I'll use it. Okay. So, uh, I'm still going to show you the quotient rule, but the chain rule proof, this is, this is more difficult. And, uh, I mean, most of you could get it, but Kevin said he couldn't, so I, what am I going to do? Well, this is the one that I had that uh, song, which, what did you guys say? It was ridiculous or annoying or something like this? Uh, low, D, high, D, high, D, low, D, high, D, high, low, E, I, E, I, O. Yeah. Okay, so this asks the question, what is the derivative of F over G? And of course, I'm always assuming in here that I'm only looking at points where g of x is not 0. Dividing by 0 would be a mistake and would lead to 1 equals 2, and we've seen how that works. 
Okay, and the song tells us that the top, which is the hard part to remember, is what? Low D high less high D low E I D I O, and the bottom is the square of the product function. Okay, that's what we would like to prove. Okay, so let's try to do it. Well, as usual, we have to compute a derivative. The beauty of this approach, though, is that after we get all our rules out, we no longer have to compute derivatives using the limit. Right? Unless, you know, we get some new function that shows up, and we have to be careful. But only a couple of those. Okay, so the first one is going to be this function applied to x plus h. So that means I need to look at f of x plus h over g of x plus h minus f of x over g of x, and then we have to divide this by h. We have to subtract fractions. Anybody remember how to subtract fractions? Or is that so, what year is this? Is that so 2002? <laughs> That was more like 1990. 1990? Are you really, you started learning fractions when you were zero? <laughs> well, let's remember how to add fractions and subtract fractions. I get the feeling at least one person in here doesn't really remember. That's okay. We all forget. And some of us were never taught. All right, now I heard Stephanie say, let's find a common denominator. That works. I don't like finding common denominators. It's too arbitrary. I just use the definition of addition of fractions. Okay, now, you probably didn't know there's actually a formal definition. Right? You can actually write down in general. I wrote down two fractions. A over B <coughs> plus C over D. There's actually a definition for what this is. You have to define everything you use in math. And at some point, somebody sat down and defined it. And the definition is AD plus BC over BD. And, well, if you had a minus here, then this would just become a minus. Now, this looks rather complicated, but <laughs> au contraire, mon frère. Let's say I wanted to quickly add a third, and, well, let's make it three just to make it more fun. Somebody, you know, you're cooking and you need to add a, a third and three sevenths. Not that I've ever seen a seventh actually show up in a recipe. Okay. Normally, you're sitting here finding common denominators for this thing, but I'm just going, okay, one times seven is seven, three times is 9, 7 plus 9 is 16, 3 times 7 is 21. Just using this formula, right? Cross multiply, cross multiply, add to get the top, multiply the bottom to get the, the denominator. Yeah? Right? And if you wanted to do it, subtract. Right? You say, okay, 7 minus 9 is minus 2 over 21. Minus 2 21st. All right. You can tell me. I think this is faster than finding common denominator. That's just me. Okay. The upshot is here, you can apply the same trick. Okay? Now, granted, you won't have some tasty answer like minus two twenty firsts, but you'll get an answer. Okay, so we cross multiply this way. F of x plus h times g of x. Okay, minus f of x times <coughs> g of x plus h divided by the product of the denominators. And then we're going to have to divide by h. But of course, if you have a fraction and then you divide by h, can I, I can just move the h up into this denominator, yeah? yeah? Unless, of course, h was 0, but I'm doing a limit. So h is never 0. I can just stick this H. I normally I'm doing all this over H, but I 
I just pop this H up? No problem. Okay, cool. One thing looks right already. I have two G's on the bottom. Okay. I'm supposed to get a G squared. Now, of course, there's the matter of this X plus H, but eventually H will go to zero, so it should all work out in the end. Yeah. Okay, what can we do from here? Well, much like when we were playing around with the product rule, we get stuck. I don't really have anything that I can factor out of both of these. So, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to add zero. <clears throat> okay, so then what's the trick? Well, the trick is figuring out what zero should I add. All right, how should I write down zero in such a way that it makes things nicer? Well, here's an idea. I have this f of x plus h. Okay? And eventually I'm going to want to get an f prime. Now f prime starts off with f of x plus h minus f of x. So I should somehow subtract something that has an f of x in it. Right? But then there's a matter of this g of x. Somehow I need to get rid of that. Oh, well, okay. I'll just put a g of x here and then I can factor it out. Okay. Now, I can't just add it, I have to subtract, or, well, subtract it, I have to add it, so I, I put it in and then I hope, I hope that it's the right thing. Okay, so then I have to put the last term, which is minus f of x, g of x plus h. Alright? Uh, right? Okay, looks right. And then all this is divided by h g of x plus h, g of x. Okay. Well, let's see here. We know it, I mean, we set it up to do something, so let's do it. Okay, I have a g of x and a g of x, which I'll factor out and get an f of x plus h minus f of x. Then I over here, I have an f of x in both terms. So I can factor that out. Now I get something in the wrong order. I have g of x minus g of x plus h. That's the opposite order I want, right? Yeah, I'm going to have to put a negative 1 in somewhere to switch the order. So, so let's do that. So let's see. So I'll factor out a g of x. And I'll put it out front like this. g of x. And then we have f of x plus h minus f of x. Okay. And then here's what I'll do is I'll write minus uh, f of x. Right. By introducing a minus, I can turn this around. g of x plus h minus g of x. Okay. Now let's just make sure I didn't flip too many minus signs. Okay. So if I put this back in, I get minus f of x g of x plus h. Good minus f of x minus g of x plus f of x g of x. Good. Yeah, are you guys familiar with the physicist Kepler? Yeah. Kepler's laws? Yeah. So on. Johannes Kepler? Yeah, okay, so he was very notorious for making a lot of mistakes in his writings, but always an even number of them so that they would cancel out. <laughs> okay, and then all of this is still over this h, g of x plus h. Okay, well, what can I do here? Well, I want to break this up. So, first thing I can do is split this up into two fractions, where this is the denominator of each one. Okay. But this bit here is a real pain. And so, let's see what we can do. Let's see. What we can do. Okay, so. First bit, I mean, eventually I need to, to break this up in, in a nice way. So, hmm, what could I do? Ah, I have an idea. I have an idea. You remember how we moved this H up? Right? We said we, everything was all over H. 
And then in the next step, all right, we just sucked it up. Okay. Well, I want to get rid of this g of x plus h times g of x. So why don't I just push it down? And then I don't have to worry about it until the very end. So instead of writing it like this, I'll write this over h and then put the whole thing. And of course, we're still inside the limit over g of x plus h times g of x. And now I don't have to worry about that until the end. OK, now, let's see what we got. I have a, a g of x, which doesn't even see the h. So it's a constant as far as the h is concerned. So I can pull that, right? If all, well, actually, first, before I pull it out, okay, I'm going to split this up into two different limits. Okay? This limit and this limit. Okay. Of course, to do that, I actually have to first split up this huge fraction into two limits. Okay, but I can do that. I mean, the limit as h goes to zero of this is no problem because g is di is continuous, right? It's differentiable, so it's certainly continuous. So I can this limit will exist. So the top and the bottom limit exist, right? Because all these are derivatives, so they're all going to exist. So I can split this up in any way I want to using the limit properties. Okay. So let me just move this down slightly. So what are we going to get? We're going to get, well, first I'll pull this g of x out times the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x over h, okay, minus, now I pull this f of x outside of the limit, and I get g of x plus h minus g of x over h, and then I divide this whole thing now by the limit as h goes to 0 of the bottom of the fraction, which is g of x plus h times g of x. Okay. And this basically kills it off. Because now I have g times the derivative of f minus f times the derivative of g divided by, well, g was differentiable, so it's continuous. So as h goes to 0, g of x plus h goes to g of x. And so I just get g squared on the bottom. So this is just g f prime minus f g prime divided by g squared. Ta-da! <coughs> Sometimes, you know, they say less is more, and more is less. And sometimes nothing is more, more or less. Okay. Any questions? This is just a nice little proof. You've seen some proofs now. Notice a few things. When you're writing up your own proofs in the exercises, at every step along the way, you notice what I started all my lines with? What am I starting each line with? Limit, right? I didn't leave those off. I know it's convenient when you're writing up your homework to just, you know, start with the limit on one and then write equals and forget the limit exists, you know, until the very end and then you plug it in. This is poor communication. Okay. Put your limits in. You would get mad if I stopped writing them. Well, I mean, you would get mad because if I stopped writing them, you know it's done, and then you'd probably be happy. This is okay. Okay, so now we have the quotient rule. Uh, the last thing is the chain rule, and I normally would postpone that discussion, but you guys are smarter, so I'll tell you. I, I want to show it to you because it, without the chain rule, it's somehow no fun. Plus, the chain rule actually solves one of the little minor problems we had before. Okay, so if 
I have two functions, f of x and g of x, I actually have two ways of, well, I use the word multiply very loosely. Okay, but I have two ways of kind of multiplying them together. And the first is the way we use it in terms of the product rule, which says if you want to evaluate this at a point, you just evaluate them separately and multiply. Okay, and that's really the product of two functions. But there's another way of kind of doing a product of two functions, and that's function composition. Okay. So recall that on the side. Right? If you have some function, uh, say x cubed, and another function uh, like sine of x, right? then it makes sense to talk about f composed g of x. Okay. And by definition, this is just take f and apply it to the output of g. Okay. And in this case, that would be, well, f is x cubed, so you put sine of x in there, so you get sine of x cubed, although this is usually written as sine cubed x. And of course you can do this backwards. G composed f of x, and this is g of f of x, and in this case that would be sine of x cubed. Okay, so this is called composition of functions. And in a sense, this is another way of multiplying functions, but not in the sense that I care to explain it. Okay, so, <coughs> these functions show up, these are, this could happen, okay? You've had worse things on your, your exercise sheet. Okay, so the question is, how do you deal with these situations when it comes to a derivative? Is there a way of noticing that this is a composition of two functions? And breaking down the derivative to only have to look at these two individual functions? Okay. And the answer is yes. And it's called the chain rule. Okay. And it is the closest thing we have to being able to say that the derivative of a product is the product of the derivatives. It's the closest thing we have. And it's going to say the following. If I compose two functions, okay, so this little circle is read compose. <coughs> I take the derivative, and this is equal to, well, the derivative of f times the derivative of g, almost. And there's a little something missing. Okay, well, actually, I guess the way I can write it. Is that a dot or a circle? This is a dot. This is actually a time. This one? That's a circle. That's composed. So it becomes, you have to first apply g and then compose it with the derivative. And then times g prime. So it's almost what you want. I mean, in a sense, right, the way you also oftentimes write this is if you have f of g of x prime, you write this as f prime of g of x times g prime of x. Okay? So it's really, I mean, it is the product of derivatives. You just have to fiddle a little bit. See another way to write this down, completely separate way. We'll get, we'll go into this in greater detail later. I just want to introduce it right now. So chain rule version two. So let's let uh, y be a function <coughs> of u. Why you? Because I want to. And we'll let you be a function of x. Okay. So you can see here I, I, I really can talk about a composition of functions in this case. Okay. I have some function of x and then I take a function applied to that. Same thing, let's, I mean here, you have a function 
and you apply a function to this. And so I'm going to switch this notation back over to this, this DDX notation here. Because it's a little more suggestive and useful in this case. So I can ask, well, if y is a function of u and u is a function of x, then y is actually a function of x. Right? Because once I determine x, it determines u. Once I know u, that determines y. So I can ask, what is the derivative of the function y as a function of x? And the chain rule says, well, that it's the derivative of y as a function of u. That's what this part is, right? The derivative of y as a function of u times the derivative of u as a function of x. Now, I told you right off the bat, these are symbols in their own rights. They are not fractions. You cannot treat them as fractions. But boy, it sure looks like you should, doesn't it? So there's more than a coincidence going on here. So later on, we will explain this coincidence a little bit more. <coughs> OK, so this is another version of the chain rule. And I'll just point out, and you can put that little note in your notes, a uh, little sticky. It says, come back to this later. Come back to this when we talk about related rates, which if you've taken calculus before, you've seen those and went, <gasps> and if you haven't, you will. <laughs> okay, so, but these are actually saying the same thing, of course, and okay? it's not a new rule. There's two different ways of writing it. And this way it has the advantage of looking like, oh, it's completely canceled. Okay. So let's see, uh, let's see examples. Maybe I'll start off with, an, with a more abstract example that will help us uh, later on. So let's see, what can I use? Okay. So, we have the power rule. Right? The power rule, we, we proved it, but only for natural numbers, possibly zero. Okay. Well, I'm not even sure if our proof works when it's zero, but the zero case is easy, because if you have x to the zero, you have the function of one. And of course, we know the derivative of one is zero, which is exactly what we can get here. Uh, okay, but we have no idea what to do if you have negative integers, right? So let's see if we can handle that case. So let's say, uh, let's look at what is the derivative of x to the minus 1, okay. which might remember, x to the minus 1 is 1 over x. Okay, remember, when you have negative exponents, it just means you can move it down beneath the denominator and make it a positive x. Of course, we've used this function all the time, so it's an important function, right? You should know how to find the derivative. Okay, how can we do that? Well, writing it this way says, ah, it's a quotient. So I should be able to use the quotient rule. <coughs> this is equal to, all right, well, I have two functions. Now, the bottom one is an x, and that's what I need to put first, so I put x. And then I'm supposed to multiply by the derivative of the top. Now, the top is a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? A zero, or was it undefined? Zero. No, it's definitely zero, right? Constant function has slope zero, okay? No problem there. So I get x times zero. Sweet! Okay. Minus? Okay, now I need to put the top function, f, that's just a 1, that's easy enough, times the derivative of the bottom function. Now the bottom function is x. What is the derivative of x? It's 1, right? If you don't believe me, look at the power rule. The power rule says if you have x to the 1, which is x, then you get 1x to the 0. 
course, x to the 0 is 1, so you get 1 times 1 is 1. Cool. Okay. Divided by, well, the denominator squared. Okay, so that's 0, that's minus 1 over x squared. Neat. Okay. And I can rewrite this as minus x to the minus 2. Okay. What if we were to apply the power rule to x to the minus 1? Okay, now, we didn't prove it for that, so we don't know it works. But let's just assume that we had or something and we were going to try to see if it made sense. Well, you get minus 1 x to the minus 2. That's what we have. Cool. Okay, it matches up. So now we can we make a conjecture that it works for any character. So we prove that. So let's look at x to the minus n. So here n is, say, greater than 0. Okay, so now we're really looking at a negative number. I don't even think we need what I'm saying here, but just to make sure we all agree this is a negative number. Okay, now, I could try to reprove everything using a similar formula, the binomial formula. But then you guys would write it, okay? So instead, I'm just going to combine a couple of rules. Okay, what rules am I going to combine? Well, one, I, I know what x to the minus 1 is. I know what the derivative is. On the other hand, I can write this as x to the minus 1 to the nth power. Yep. Agree? Okay. So I actually have a composition of functions. Right? I have two functions. I have, say, f of x equals x to the n, and g of x equals x to the minus 1. And so f of g of x is equal to x to the minus 1 to the n. Well, n is greater than zero, and minus n, but minus n will be negative. That, and that we want. We want minus n to be negative. So n is greater than zero, and that's important because I want to apply the chain rule to the situation. Right? I have a composition of functions. Right? One of them is this function. One of them is that function. And I only know the derivative of this function when n is positive, right? or at least zero. Okay? And so that's why I insist that n be greater than zero. Okay. So but here I can use the chain rule. The chain rule says, well, let's see what it says. It says you take the derivative of this outside function. Okay, so the outside function is x to the n. Okay. So I take the derivative of that and I apply it to the inside function. So the derivative of x to the n would be nx to the n minus 1. But everywhere I see an x, I have to put an x inverse, because it's the inside function. So I get n x inverse to the n minus 1 times, right, well the chain rule doesn't end there, times the derivative of the inside function. Okay? And of course the derivative of the inside function is what we just computed. It's minus x to the minus 2. So I get minus x to the minus 2. And now I just do a little bit of algebra. Let's see. The minus and the n become a minus n. OK. Um, x to the minus 1 to the n minus 1 is what? Well, you multiply these back together, and you get 1 minus n. All right, or x to the 1 minus n. And then I have an x to the minus 2 still. OK. Uh, so that's minus n x to the, OK, so I have to add these exponents. So 1 minus n minus 2 is minus 1 minus n, or minus n minus 1. OK, so. What would the power rule told us if we had applied it illegally? It would have said, 
bring the minus n down, okay? And then subtract one. Subtract one. Sweet. Okay. So this means we can go back to our power rule and replace the natural numbers including zero with a full set of integers. So that's very nice. Okay, so let's apply this in many cases. Uh, okay, I have to get rid of something. I'll just assume that you now are all experts on this and have them all memorized. Or at least have them written down in your notes. I had a wonderful professor who came and gave a talk when I was in grad school, and an excellent talk. And three years later, he came back to give another talk at the same school. And he said, now, I see a lot of you were here in the last talk three years ago, so I'll assume that you remember what I said, and went on from there. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> well, to the people that weren't there three years ago. Well, he may have given a, given them a few details during the course of the talk. He's a, he's a bit of a kid. Those, you know those Germans, they're wacky. Okay, so let's do just a, let's just do a whole bunch of examples. Now, there's one reason we can't do as many examples right now as I want, and that is we still don't know the derivatives of some pretty important functions. Like trigonometric functions, exponential functions, logarithmic functions. But at least we're pretty good with polynomials, or at least we should be. So let's just do an example. Say we're going to do minus x cubed plus 2x squared plus 4. Okay, so it's a polynomial. Polynomials are differentiable, no problem there. Those are really beautiful. <coughs> uh, no problems with polynomials. <coughs> and we have a derivative of a sum, so I can break that up as a sum of the derivatives. Now, in the beginning, we write that out in full detail. And as the term goes on, we don't. Right? Because eventually, I figure you know that the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. But just for the first day, we do this. We first write this as the derivative of minus x cubed plus the derivative of 2x squared plus the derivative of 4. Okay? Now, there's a minus here, which is a constant, minus 1 if you like. I can pull that out. There's a 2 here, that's a constant. I can pull that out. And that's a derivative of a constant, which we all said was 0. So that's just going to go away. So we get minus the derivative of x cubed plus 2 times the derivative of x squared. And now we have the derivative of x cubed. Ah, this is exactly what the power rule is made for. This becomes 3 times x squared. And then we don't get the minus. So minus 3x squared plus, again, we've reduced it. The derivative of, a, of x to something, we use the power rule. This becomes 2x to the first, or just 2x. We don't forget the 2, we get 4x. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I wonder if the camera is strong enough to pick up yawnings. Yawns. I think yawnings are those things you have outside your house, <coughs> hang down over the window. Yawnings. <laughs> you think it's bad to be sitting here in class? I have to deal with the fact that these are all going to be on the internet for anybody to see. <laughs> and according to the Can stack counter, what's that? Can you edit that out? I'm not sure. I, I must be able to. Uh, what's that? Oh, I can edit that. That does not mean the university. I, I, Michelle Bolzer said there's no privacy issue. I don't have to worry about it. As long as you guys sign the confidentiality agreements. So, so that's good. Uh, 
Okay. Let's do another example. Let's do the derivative of x plus 3 cubed. What would you like to write? You mean write x plus 3 cubed equals? No, like when you keep, when you're doing the derivative, you have to break that out and the simple stuff, like how you get over there. Okay, so like I said, in the beginning, we write it down every step because that way you know what I'm doing and I know what you're doing. Okay, but after a couple of weeks, then I go, okay, they know what I'm doing and I know what they're doing. We don't have to write that down every step anymore. Okay? So, you know, eventually you get good at these things, and then you don't need to write it down. I mean, I would never, I mean, if I was working this problem, you know, a professor says, find this derivative, you know, at this point in my career, you know, I'm just writing this down. You know, I'm just writing the answer. Okay? But we're pedantic to that, just so that in case somebody in here is not thinking, oh, this is so trivial, this is so easy, All right, they can at least take notes and try to follow. Okay. All right, so let's see how you do this. All right, well, what rule do I want to use to attack this? I want to use the chain rule, right? Because, well, if it was just an x, then I'd use the power rule. Okay? But I don't have just an x, I have something cubed, right, which is not just an x. So I have to use the chain rule. Right? So it's going to be two functions. One of them is the cube function, and one of them is the function x plus 3. Okay. And the chain rule says that this is equal, well, if you like, to the derivative of... So that's not a very good way to write it. In this case, I'm just going to write it out. Okay? Let's, just, let's use our hands. Okay. We'll hand wave you proof. Okay? It says we first take the derivative of this function, x cubed. Okay. And then we evaluate it at the inside function x plus 3. Okay. So the power rule says this becomes 3x squared, right? But then everywhere we see an x, we have to put x plus 3. Okay. So if this bit here is your g of x, okay, and x cubed equals f of x, Right? Then we've taken the derivative of f of x and evaluated it at g of x. Then we have to multiply by the derivative of g of x. So what's the derivative of x plus 3? Well, if you're clever, you look at the answer I already put as the final answer and say, well, this is better than 1. Okay? Well, let's see. Right, how it works, well, let's at least write it down very explicitly just this one time. Okay. So this is the derivative of x plus the derivative of 3. Okay. This term is 0 because it's the derivative of a constant. Okay. And this I can use the power of. So I get 1x to the 0, which is, of course, 1. So this whole bit becomes 1. I get 3x plus 3 squared. Okay. Now, as we get more of the functions into our world, the trigonometric functions, exponential, and so on, I can start making these chain rule problems arbitrarily difficult by embedding more and more functions within them. Okay. Uh, to, put it, to put it another way, was there reason I need to stop at 2 here, right? What if I said let uh, x be a function of w? So now, y is a function of u, which is a function of x, which is a function of w. So I could view y as a function of w. And what would its derivative be? Well, it would be the derivative of y with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to x times the derivative of x with respect to w. Right. So I can start using this chain rule over and 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 over, and over, and over again. And so I'm going to just throw those at you at some point. Just going to throw you these nasty chain rule problems that expand and contract and do all sorts of weird stuff. 
and you're going to hate me, and you're going to have nightmares about me, and you're going to wake up in the morning and say, Darn you, math man! But then you'll ace the final. It'll all be good. Okay, uh, let's do some more next time.